introduce a new lemon cookie. We had unemployment below 3%. Uh, the outlook for our economy was very bullish and strong. And uh, Seattle, I just delivered my state of the city address a few weeks before that. And uh, we had a very optimistic look at where the city of Seattle would be in 2020 and 2021. Um, today, things have shifted significantly. Um, as Ben will tell you, we are looking at a potential $300 million shortfall in revenue, um, which is approximately 20% less than we expected in our general fund. Our general fund is the thing that, that pays for all of those things people associate with government doing its basic job, as well as the social service things we provide. The COVID-19 pandemic has become one of the most consequential events ever in the history of our city. And as we have responded, we have not only have our revenues significantly decreased, as he said, but we have also had to expend monies in ways that we did not anticipate to try to support the many, many people across the city who have lost their jobs or their businesses who need food security and the like. So at the same time that we are um, have fewer revenues, we've also been expending money to give those basic supports to the people in our community. So we think about the coming budget, the 2020 budget, and our city's response, we will still be focused on um, three priorities in the days and months to come as we formulate our budget for this year and next year. Number one, we will still be focusing with the county executive and the governor on decreasing the community spread of COVID-19. While we've been very fortunate that everyone in the city has done what we've asked of them and people are staying home, we also know that we still have too many people who are getting sick and too many people who are dying. We are not out of the woods and we need to continue to drive that number down. We also at the same time know that we have to at some point reopen our society, our community and our economy. And so we are simultaneously preparing for what that might look like. What types of things can open where people can come together, but it can be done in a safe manner so that we do not see a spike in cases that overwhelm our health care. Over the last seven weeks, as the city has worked to address this pandemic, <clears throat> we've really deployed a number of measures to bring community relief. Um, our, all of our initiative have been focused on trying to do, provide that immediate relief because we knew there would be a period of time that the state would not be able to step in soon enough and the federal government would not be able to step in. Important part of our assistance really was looking for resources here that we could immediately utilize to help people in Seattle. At the same time, we advocated with our federal partners. I'd like to thank our congressional delegation for all the hard work that they have done throughout this pandemic to really look out for workers, small businesses, and the people who are struggling the most through this pandemic. Um, they've also been very good at, at talking to us in the city about what we would need going forward so that we could continue to provide the basic services that everyone in this city needs. You know, we really, our cities have become the front line in this fight. And for a very long time, we've also been the safety net for America. We have to be able to continue many of those vital roles. So as we move forward, we will continue to need state and federal support. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Ben now to walk things through, but just uh, I think uh, we'll come back in closing, but would say very clearly, these have been unprecedented times and unprecedented both in the scope and scale of this disease, but also in the challenge that we're facing as a city. Uh, so many people have lost their work or their businesses they work hard to establish. Our frontline healthcare workers have been working untold hours, sometimes without the protection that they needed. Uh, I continue to be inspired by those people who are showing up every day to help our community. And the thousands of acts of courage and kindness that I see in this city I was able to speak yesterday to a number of chefs, for example, who formed a cooperative to change their kitchens into feeding and, and supporting the restaurants they owned into feeding the community in which they live. It is that kind of 
collaborative, collective efforts that will get us through this, even in, in this very dark and challenging time. And with that, Ben, I'll let you walk them through the budget and then I'll make some comments at the end and then we'll take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I'm gonna move through this presentation rather quickly, um, just uh, uh, conscious of time. It is a pretty dense presentation, so um, I'll leave time for questions at the end. Uh, so next slide, actually skip ahead to the first substantive slide. Um, so uh, as the mayor described, we regularly provide um, a update to the uh, city council on revenues um, uh, in, in April. Um, so this is part of that normal pattern. Um, obviously it's very different circumstances. Um, our forecast, uh, we, we have a model of the regional economy, which I'll talk about more. Um, and we, uh, there are a set of inputs that we uh, put into that model. One of them is, is data from the national level. So in a moment here, I'm gonna to describe um, the information we have from our national forecast forecasters who feed our model. We then, I'm gonna describe it in a minute, we then supplement that. So uh, we subscribe to a, um, a national forecast uh, firm and they, their, their inputs have been a standard part of our modeling, revenue modeling for uh, multiple years. Um, normally, we bring a forecast that is a single a single estimate. Um, we acknowledge that there's uncertainty about it, but we say, you know, we tell the mayor and the council that we expect this much money in 2020 and this much in 2021, et cetera. Uh, this scenario, in this case, we are actually showing a range. We're going to uh, talk about two different scenarios, um, and I say that um, because it, it emphasizes the level of uncertainty that we are facing in this. Uh, normally, the forecaster forecast firm has a, a baseline forecast, um, and, and they in a, in a confidence level of something like 70 or plus percent around that. Uh, this time they have a baseline forecast, a pessimistic forecast. Um, they also have an, uh, an, op an optimistic forecast. Um, I actually think the optimistic one has already been overrun by the data we've received since. I mean, unemployment is already uh, outpacing the, 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 their, their optimistic forecast, which suggests it's not really in play. But as you can see here, um, they're, they're both, both uh, scenarios uh, anticipate a significant recession. Um, the baseline uh, has uh, the U.S. GDP dropping by five, almost five and a half percent um, in 2020. Unemployment peaking uh, at 10 percent. Um, the pessimistic scenario um, has GDP dropping by almost 15 percent, and unemployment peaking um, at 22 um, percent, which is our levels that are actually comparable um, to the depression, or or so I have read, if you will. Um, and then all all these scenarios anticipate the stimulus uh, um, legislation that has passed, um, and not necessarily stuff that will pass yet. Um, and then also the the Fed policies that are that are in place. Uh, move ahead. Next slide. So the just uh, back up real quick. Sorry, move too fast. So this just just trying to describe to you um, how the regional forecast is developed. Um, we have a model um, uh, that covers King and Snohomish counties. That's really what we think of as the integrated economy here. Uh, I mentioned the inputs from the the uh, national forecast level. Then we also have um, uh, information from the, at state level. Um, and some local uh, information, things like the, the permit data from SDCI can be helpful for us understanding the construction sector, employment data from employment securities. Um, the model then, and you'll see some of the, this output in just a moment, uh, uh, lets us develop estimates of, of um, local employment, local income, um, et cetera. Those outputs are then fed into um, modeling that tracks how the local economy uh, lines up with our city revenues. We've been able to see those correlations over time, so we understand that pretty well. Um, we are uh, gonna, moving forward here, as I described this, we're gonna talk about a rapid recovery scenario, as you can see here, and a slow recovery scenario. The rapid recovery roughly uh, corresponds to the, to the baseline of our national forecasters. The slow recovery, their more pessimistic uh, forecast. So, um, and again, these are some of the outputs from our regional model. And, uh, a couple of things I want to emphasize here. One is just how significant um, uh, an economic uh, uh, impact we are uh, likely to see here. So um, in the slow recovery, sort of the more pessimistic scenario, local unemployment uh, peaking at 18% at, at or higher, um, uh, income dropping by 12.5% um, uh, as well. Again, the, the less pessimistic scenarios, we're still looking at very significant levels of unemployment. Um, uh, job losses, you know, 65,000 jobs lost um, in, in the local economy. And that's that's in the better scenario. 
other thing I want to emphasize here, if you look at these graphs, is that this is not just a 2020 challenge. The impacts on the economy are reasonably forecast to last um, a good a good deal of time here. Um, in the more pessimistic scenario, even in 2024, we're not back to where we might otherwise have been. So, um, and if, from a financial and a budgetary perspective, we need to consider that this is potentially also long lasting. Next slide. Um, so a point that I've mentioned, but I want to emphasize again, is the level of uncertainty that we're working with. Um, we don't actually, as we sit here, have any meaningful data, uh, revenue data, actual revenue data from the crisis period. So as the mayor described, this has largely hit us um, in March, you know, really late February, uh, March. Um, the This table outlines when uh, when tax payments are due um, and the delay as a result that we see um, in the data. So for instance, property taxes actually only generally, well, they only come in twice a year. Um, there's normally a payment um, in April and then another in October. Um, the April payment has actually been delayed, so it'll be some time before we see um, even the first the full a full set of results for the, for the first half of those payments. Uh, B and O taxes, which are our business taxes, they're generally due quarterly, and the payment is due, excuse me, a month after the end of the quarter. So the first quarter payments for B&O taxes aren't, aren't actually due until the end of this month, and then you know it takes us a little while to compile them. So, so we're working in the dark in no small part, and I just I think that's important to understand in general. Um, and then, and this lag will be something that persists for us. I mean, it, it'll, you know, when we're in June, we'll be seeing we'll be uh, still waiting to see the, the April data, if you will. Um, that said, um, the, uh, the data from unemployment, uh, from unemployment insurance claims so for, is, is, uh, arrives with about a week lag. So we'll see that regularly. The, um, the sales tax we get was a delay, but we get it more regularly as well. Um, so I just wanted to highlight here, these are the percentages on this table highlight the, how important these revenue streams are to the general fund. Um, uh, just by the way, REIT is included here. It, it doesn't technically go to the general fund but it is a significant funding source for the city for the capital um, uh, and physical infrastructure that supports basic services. Um, and it's one that we get with relatively little lag, so it has the potential to provide us um, useful real-time information. Um, next slide. So having acknowledged, and I, I realize it's hard to read, I, I will narrate here some. Having acknowledged that we don't have a great deal of real data, um, we wanted to, to demonstrate that there is every reason, in case you wondered, to be very concerned about our revenue streams and how they will be affected. And we can see that by looking at what feeds and what the composition of uh, our key economically driven sources. So sales tax in this graphic and B&O in the next. So um, again, you may not be able to read, but just in the blue, this is showing the shares of uh, the industries that drive sales tax in, in percentage terms. So, um, the, and I'm gonna talk about the three biggest pieces here. So the, the blue, which is about a third, that's wholesale and retail trade. That's, that's people out shopping. Um, uh, and I, I would note, not shopping for food. Food is, is not subject to sales tax. So in the one bit of activity that is uh, remaining presumably strong now is not actually subject to our tax. So that's good public policy. We, we shouldn't tax food, but it, that does mean that that, that that principal activity that we're seeing now isn't generating revenue in that way. Um, so that's, that's fully a third. Uh, construction, uh, the grays is uh, 25%, actually 27, uh, I was running down a little bit there. Um, again, construction has not been designated an essential function, so a good deal of that activity has stopped. Um, and we'll, it is an open question how much resumes um, once uh, uh, physical proximity is possible again. And then the orange piece is food service and recreation and accommodation. So that is both local restaurants uh, and people, locals uh, at restaurants which obviously isn't happening. It's also though our tourism sector in no small part. Uh, the retail trade is a piece of that too. So again, every reason, although we don't have the real data, there's no question that we are uh, at significant risk here on the sales tax front. Um, next slide uh, is a picture for, for the business and occupation tax, the same set of information. Uh, I won't go into detail. What you see here is that it, it's the B&O is, is, uh, has a broader base. It's fed by more industry sectors in, in more relatively more equal shares. However, um, and so we expect we expect the impacts here in percentage terms to be a little bit smaller. But again, I um, want to emphasize at the moment, all of these sectors um, are being affected um, in, in a negative way. So um, we're going to expect a significant impact here as well. Uh, next slide. 
So uh, this at a very high level, very high level, is the forecast for the general fund for the next three years under the two scenarios, the, the slow recovery and the rapid recovery. Um, these figures are in billions. We don't usually uh, put things up that way, but in order to get things to fit on the, on the page, that was important to do. And again, two things to emphasize here, and, and you'll see this in the next charts as well. One is the depth of the fall off that we're projecting in 2020. Um, so very significant reductions. Um, I'll talk in a little bit about why these um, don't line up exactly to the $300 million figure we cited earlier. Um, uh, but the other point to make here uh, that I've mentioned before is the path to recovery and that this isn't a, just a 2020, 20, excuse me, a 2020 issue. Um, we're going to expect significantly less revenues than we otherwise would have had in 21 and in 22 as well. Um, and so the adjustments, we're going to need to make near-term adjustments to uh, deal with the, the situation on the ground as we speak. But we'll also uh, normally, and as we speak, we're, we're building, starting to build the budgets for 21 and 22. Uh, next year is the first year of our biennial budget process. Um, but uh, those will have to acknowledge a significant uh, decline in expected revenues as well. Next slide. Uh, so here we're getting to the gory detail um, and, the, and the backup, if you will, for the, the $300 million estimate. So um, I'm going to walk here through a little bit slowly. Um, what you have here is, uh, again, a detailed chart showing the, the, new, the new forecast numbers uh, and the difference. So uh, just column by column here, uh, first of all, we've highlighted the major revenue sources to the to the city's general fund, and I will talk about some of these other revenues in just a moment. So property tax, sales tax, B&O, uh, utility taxes, um, uh, court fines and parking. We don't normally call that one out, but you can see here, given the, the significant drop in revenues, it, it was worth highlighting. Um, so the, the 2019 just gives you a sense of what our baseline would, was last year. Uh, 2020 is the adopted uh, forecast uh, for those um, revenues. It's a little bit lower because the, under the all else category, um, as frequently as grants, and we don't know in, in expectation how many grants we're going to get. So wouldn't read too much into the 2020 number being slightly smaller than the 2019 number. Would read very much significance into the next column, which is our revised number for 2020. And you can see the decline there. Um, and you can read the specific figures. That represents um, a roughly 20% reduction in sales tax, just just, just under that for B&O tax. Significant decrease in utility taxes. You can read these figures. And again, highlighting, if shifting to 21 and 22, if you just look at the percentage change line underneath the bold, you see, um, again, this is the slow recovery uh, forecast. Um, you can see relatively small growth into 2021 um, and starting to pick up in 2022. Um, we don't, normally when we do this forecast, we just highlight on the general fund and not on the revenues that are separately earned from other city departments. Um, but uh, in this case, I think it is important to acknowledge those revenue shortfalls. Usually there's just not that much variation in how much revenue Seattle Center, for instance, in, in parks and recreation uh, take in. They earn money from rentals and from fees and the like. And, we increase those fees usually in an inflationary way every couple of years. Um, but these are dramatic drops in revenue. Um, and um, unless we make up for these, it would have to be very significant uh, reductions in activities in those uh, and staffing in those um, in those departments. Um, so I think it is in part of portraying the total uh, hit, if you will, to the city. It's important to acknowledge those. I, I do want to take a moment to say that um, we're talking here about revenues that support general fund activities. Um, we don't have in this presentation impacts to the utilities or to the fee revenues earned by um, Department of Construction and, um, uh, and um, STCI. Uh, why am I suddenly blanking? But anyway, uh, inspections, construction inspections. So uh, those are not included. But again, it was important to acknowledge the impacts to Seattle Center and Parks and Recreation. Um, and again, with, with facilities closed and, and no activity in terms of performances and the like, these revenue impacts are not necessarily a surprise. Next page. Um, again, these the revenues highlighted here are not strictly uh, legally, if you will, flowing into the general fund, but they again support general government activities, um, things like um, housing and economic development um, and food uh, distribution and the like. So important to acknowledge the impacts here as well. Um, and again, in percentage terms, some very some very significant um, projected losses. Admissions tax, um, 
uh, down by 70%, give or take. Um, Short-term rental tax, which is a, a tax on things like Airbnb, um, off by half, and uh, some risk that that would be higher. Uh, sweet and beverage, a soda tax, um, again, with no with no restaurant activity at, uh, in downtown at lunch, just as an example, um, significant drop there. Um, real estate excise tax, um, significant shortfalls there. Again, um, uncertainty in the financial markets and, uh, and employment in general um, uh, impacts there. STBD is the Seattle Transportation Benefit District. Um, about half of its revenues come from sales tax. Um, I'm expecting the same pattern of about a 20% drop So you, in, uh, in that side. So you see significant impacts there. Um, commercial parking tax, um, uh, school zones, cameras, uh, and again, so an additional 80 plus million from those revenue sources. And so in total, uh, almost $300 million in general fund and general fund related uh, revenues um, that we expect at shortfall. Again, you can see that's relative to a base of about 1.7 billion because um, it is somewhat larger than the general fund when you add in these other sources. Last slide. So uh, how are we, uh, we going to address this? Well, we are, uh, we are working on that now. I wanted to highlight um, some of the resources we have available. Um, the, the, we have two significant reserves in the city that are meant to address um, situations like this, the rainy day fund and the emergency fund. In total, on, on, uh, more than $127 million uh, available there. Um, we finished 2019, uh, maybe some irony in this, stronger than we had expected, um, uh, just short of $20 million there. Uh, we have already taken steps um, uh, to reduce 2020 spending. Uh, obviously, that's going to have to be part of the solution here. So there's a hiring freeze on for uh, vacancies in the city, uh, no new uh, service contracts that are not related to COVID. Um, we've asked departments and are now reviewing proposals to eliminate discretionary non-COVID spending. Um, we are looking to see what other resources, uh, one-time and fund balance type resources, things that um, are, are available. Um, Looking, looking at the at the existing levies for some potential flexibility. Uh, the levies and the Metropolitan Park District, um, which was voter approved, but is not technically a levy, they rely on property taxes, which historically through recessions um, have held up much better. Um, that they're not subject to the same economic swings in general. So um, there are resources there, um, and it may be that we can shift those to support more basic activities rather than to be additive activities. The levies were anticipated that there would be a base level of funding to which they would be added. Um, that base level of funding is clearly under threat now, given these uh, these impacts. And the last point that we haven't talked about that is, is well worth discussion is that um, I've been talking about revenues, but not about expenditures. Um, we have obviously um, are expending resources um, in, in in battling COVID and it's and trying to mitigate its impacts. Um, to date, we spent about 15 million. Um, anticipate that that could easily reach 100 million, um, cause, both because we're only part way through this and because we continue to ramp up our, our efforts. But that's money being spent on uh, shelters, uh, so uh, decreasing the density in the shelters, on food um, support, on uh, rental assistance, on, on first responder protective equipment, um, a variety of these things. At, uh, to date, it appears that most of that spending will be um, avail uh, eligible for federal and state um, reimbursement. So um, we're not as concerned uh, about those impacts, although that is certainly part of what we will have to manage as well. So high level, um, that's that's where we are. Um, and that's the presentation that will be delivered to council tomorrow. So available for questions. Yeah, thank you, Ben, for that. And um, before we take questions, I just want to say again that we know that the city of Seattle has been battling through an unprecedented difficult time. Uh, the challenges that each individual is facing uh, are frontline workers. And at the same time, our city workers continue to do the really um, necessary jobs that they are doing day in, day out to one, deliver the kind of relief that we've described here today to be able to continue to inspect bridges and, and move forward on West Seattle Bridge to make sure that we deliver power and light and pick up garbage. Um, and so we have tried very hard to continue all the basic services, even among this pandemic. As Ben noted, going into this, we knew that, the, that because of the actions we would have to take, that our economy would 
uh, suffer some impacts and so immediately took steps to um, you know freeze hiring to uh, make sure there were people who were not traveling unnecessarily those kinds of restrictions will go forward as we manage to this crisis this is of a proportion that the city has not seen in many many generations it's some factor higher than even the recession of 2008 so it will require the city working together with our state and federal partners um, as well as the residents and businesses of Seattle to manage our way through this to really focus on what we need to do as a city and how we all pull together. So I'm happy to take some questions or they can be addressed to Ben as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Director Noble. Our first questions are going to be for you, Mayor. Um, from David Croman, uh, considering the shortfall, do you believe a payroll tax on large business or do you would you consider a payroll tax on large businesses as a possible backfill? So there is actually it's a great question, David, and I think there's a lot of confusion among the public. The payroll tax that is being considered right now by city council is not available in any way, shape or manner to address budget shortfalls this year or next year. That payroll tax, if it, any payroll tax passes, it would not be collected until 2022. And so in, in addressing this shortfall and this deficit, we are not going to be able to avail ourselves of a payroll tax. I really hope that council is very forthcoming with the public about that fact, that there are no ways or mechanisms or tricks to somehow magically have money appear this year or next year to fix these budget shortfalls. So I think that that your question highlights, I think a really it was a misconception that a lot of people have in terms of the payroll tax itself and whether it could be a fix. It clearly could not. Thank you, Mayor. Second question from uh, David Croman. Seattle has always operated on a balanced budget. Would you consider deficit spending in the short term? So that is required by our state constitution and our city charter. I don't think that we will have the capability of changing that this year. I think we can have a dialogue with the state um, and we've, we've been looking and talking to some of the people from the outside about whether we would be able to bond for certain things because I do believe Seattle will come back. I think that in three and five years we will see an economy that returns. It will be different than it was uh, two months ago, but I believe very strongly that the city has what it needs to build a very strong and vibrant economy. But it is going to take a period of years, not months, um, to get to that point. And so having a discussion with the state and others about how we might be able to do some outside financing to, to cover some of those gaps in a prudent way, I think is uh, important for us to do. Just, I have a, a technical point I could add add to that. One thing that we can do and, and might, can, one thing we can do and might consider doing is um, increasing the debt we use to pay for some of our capital expenditures. Um, issuing debt for capital is something we do on a regular basis. We generally try to strike a balance between how much we cash we pay for with cash and how much we pay for, for with debt, just like you would in your own personal finances, for instance, in buying a house. You try to, try to put some down on cash. Um, but in a situation like this, shifting more towards debt and less towards cash is definitely a strategy that, that could make sense. As the mayor says, every expectation that the economy will will recover in some ways. So that is definitely, uh, it's, that's not a, a broad based, you know, uh, debt financing of the, of the budget, but it is a way to take advantage of our strong credit rating and our strong history and our financial strength um, to provide some near term cash. Thank you. Uh, question for you, Director Noble from Carolyn Adolph, KUOW. In the, fa uh, in the fast recovery, slow recovery scenarios, how well do tax revenues from construction perform? In the past, tech construction has powered us through. Given that tech seems uninterrupted, can construction revenues from technology sector save us again? Um, I, I have to dig in deeper to give you the precision, uh, a precise answer on our uh, the, the construction. Uh, the pattern that we have seen in general with construction in the past, however, in this kind of a scenario, and I, and I think back specifically to, to the 2008 recession, um, is that once activity is, is physically allowed, is that many of the projects that are that are underway will continue to the end because um, there is then some uh, hope of the, of the the investors generating revenues. Um, these projects are all financed um, with debt in some form, so they're going to be looking for some revenue streams to help address that debt. So, projects that are underway um, likely to see them completed. Um, 
uh, whether or not new projects start will be a big question. And um, and I, I, the tech sector has obviously been strong, but at the end of the day, what we're talking about is the overall demand for office space. Um, and, and we have a number of projects underway. So um, it, I, I would strengthen the tech sector alone will not will not drive uh, the construction sector unto itself. And let me let me add to that. I think also people should not have the expectation that the tech sector will remain as strong as it is. I think it has weathered the storm better than most. But even the tech sector um, is based on the premise that the consumers are buying. And as consumer confidence drops or there's not dollars for consumers to spend, the tech industry itself starts to suffer. In addition, we now have, even in the Northwest, our tech industry um, is having most of its workforce work from home. And they're realizing that their premises that they had in terms of what they needed for physical space, I think is changing. There's a, there's a very robust national conversation now on whether the tech industry itself will reconfigure as it was before to have central headquarters and offices or whether they will have more of a spoken hub. And so in many ways, Seattle's gonna have to fight to get those people back into Seattle doing their work and make the case that it's still the best place and the best way for them to conduct their businesses. Thank you. Um, Mayor, a uh, question addressed to you from Daniel Beekman at the Seattle Times. Is the city currently planning to lay off or furlough employees? So Dan, that's a great question. We're not at the juncture yet where we would reduce the workforce, but we're gonna be looking very carefully at these projections and the next projections. We're going to be very focused on the jobs people do. Obviously, we've seen now more than ever the importance of the work that the people working for the city of Seattle are doing. We will continue to have in place hiring freezes and restrictions on things like travel and gatherings. Um, and we will look to see if there is additional reorganizations or things like that we need or can do. Um, we are not at that stage yet, but obviously we're having conversations on an ongoing basis for the unions that represent our city workers so that we stay in close communication so they know the truth about our financial situation and we can work through that together. Great. And Mayor, one more for you from uh, Erica Barnett, C is for Crank. How much money from the two emergency funds are you willing to use to help make up the 2020 shortfall? I don't think that there's a number that people would put on that and I'd let Ben describe that, but we need at this point to understand all of the sources we're going to have of funds. What are the federal funds we're going to have? Which of them can be used for to replace spending? Which of them might be able to use for replace of revenue? So we, we Ben gave the list of the places we might go. And until we really get to the final balancing packet, we won't know exactly how much we can or should take from every source. Let me give you an example. For example, if we are able to get from the federal government more relief for lost revenue, which cities are fighting for across the nation, then we may be able to reduce the amount we have to use this year for from our emergency funds and from our rainy day funds and use it next year because the shortfalls we have this year will continue to next year. So we are very concerned in balancing not just for the one year, but over a period of years. And as you know, Erica, from being around City Hall a lot, this is usually when budget season begins in earnest and we're, we're, we're looking at the package for next year and we've got to be doing that at the same time that we're figuring out what we need to cut and how we can cut just to get through the, and balance this budget for this year. Thank you, Mayor. A few questions here for uh, Director Noble from Kevin Schofield. Uh, uh, SEC Insight. Kevin Schofield asks, property taxes seem to be one saving grace in the budget with only a small decrease. How comfortable are you with that projection in the model and how dependent is that projection on the recession being short? That's a, another, another good question. So um, the, the estimate there is modeled largely on, on what we saw during the last recession so that there was an increase essentially in, in delinquencies and that's really what's represented in that forecast. Um, it, long story, but uh, changing property values don't inherently change uh, the revenues that the city earns from property taxes. Um, so uh, I, I have some concern that you know that again that we will see a pattern of, of delinquencies that are that are different than we have seen in the past. Um, uh, again, this, 
a point relative to the uncertainty here. You know, the what we are experiencing is not something that is in the recorded financial history of you know the last fifty or or sixty years. So the modeling and the forecasting generally relies on that historical database, if you will. So this uh, this isn't like any recession we have seen before, and so the patterns of uh, of, of behavior and, and people's ability in this case to pay their property taxes, we don't know what that's going to look like. That is one that I I'm, I'm anxious to monitor going forward. Um, and again, one that will be tricky because the payment schedule is are very uh, uh, very lumpy. There are two two large payments that are due um, on the on the property tax side. So we'll we'll see some of that um, uh, very short, relatively shortly. Um, there will be some payments in April. Um, uh, have to do with the way the, the, the waiver for payment was offered. Um, and then the rest of them will be due uh, in June if there's not an extension there. I believe it's June. So um, one we're going to have to keep our eye on. And I think to add to that, Ben, you had also noted, and I think Kevin would appreciate this, is um, in the last recession, we saw a high level of uh, <clears throat> mortgage defaults. If we were able to see any uh, ratio of mortgage defaults because of people's not having any income, many of the uh, mortgage holders are the ones that actually pay the property taxes uh, and they would quit paying under those scenarios. So I think we're going to have to see for a period of time what the level of default is and then into next year, whether if the sales um, go down, whether there's valuations that start to decrease, which would also lower the amount of property taxes that we could collect as a government. Okay, and this is the last question we'll be able to take right now um, from Briar Dudley at the Seattle Times Ed Board. Will the uh, budget need to be revised mid-year or will there be an interim budget drafted sooner than fall? We have to balance every quarter. Ben, do you want to walk through the timing of how we do that as, and as well as when we prepare for the budget for next year? Certainly. Uh, we generally I'm going to make sure that I'm on. We we generally um, provide uh, make adjustments over the course of the of the year to the budget. So we, we send down a, a supplemental. We call it a quarterly supplemental. We do. Last year we did a second quarter supplemental where there were some uh, budget changes and and, a, and then also one in the third quarter and actually had a, a technical one even in the fourth quarter. So there are a number of of uh, budgetary actions that will will be needed to to rebalance the 2020 budget. Um, the timing of those um, uh, is is to be determined. Um, we're able to, to not spend, um, so we've already given these directions to on the hiring freeze and the like. Those can be done, uh, actions to not execute the budget can be done administratively. Um, however, um, there, in order to uh, to invoke the emergency fund or the, um, the rainy day fund to accept some of the federal monies and the like, um, council action um, is needed, so legislation will be needed. So um, the exact timing of that, uh, it is all moving um, too quickly and too uncertain for me to, to give you a precise, um, precise dates on that. But I would expect um, in the early part of the summer, uh, we'll uh, uh, be bringing some stuff. And there's actually already been some legislation uh, sent to council on this front. So we've accepted some federal dollars that were um, uh, being directed towards food um, and to small business assistance and the like. So um, we're taking actions as needed. Um, moving quickly where we can administratively and, and engaging um, with legislation as necessary. So I want to thank everyone for taking the time and again just emphasize that you know this probably will be the toughest economic climate that our city has faced in multiple generations and what the city will have to do is going to be very tough but it's a reflection of the fact that what we know is that what every individual resident and business is having to do right now is also tough. And so we are in this together. We want to keep everyone as informed as possible and give everyone the facts so they understand the magnitude of the challenge, but also the, the consequences of the choices we make going forward. So thank you very much for taking the time today um, and stay home, stay healthy.